Hey guys and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. I'm John and in this video we'll be talking about vaccines as well as the anti-vaccination movement and the implications that come with it. Let's get started. This topic is one that I had on my list for a little while, but it's also the most requested topic by you guys, so here we are. If there's another topic that you guys would be interested in, be sure to let me know in the comments. Also, before we get started, try to keep in mind that this is a very important message for our protection, and I would really appreciate if you guys could share it with anyone you might know that has an anti-vaccination point of view, so that they can get more information from outside of their anti-vaccination conversation groups. And now let's dive into it. The term that's generally used to represent people with an anti-vaccination standpoint is anti-vaxxer. These people can become believers due to a belief in vaccine controversies, a belief that vaccines can do things that aren't possible, a belief that countries that have mandatory vaccination are part of a bigger deception, or they might simply mistrust the scientific, medical, and governmental entities that develop it, manage it, and distribute it. In recent years, there are an increasing and alarming number of vaccine-preventable outbreaks and the World Health Organization identified vaccine hesitancy for oneself or one's children as one of the top 10 global health threats in 2019. The anti-vaccination movement is nothing new. This actually started when vaccines were invented by Edward Jenner in 1796 when he introduced an arm-to-arm -arm vaccination that protected against smallpox. Arm-to-arm -arm inoculation was done by taking material from a blister of someone infected with cowpox and injecting it into another person's skin. Cowpox was very similar to smallpox, but much milder. The observation that dairy farmers were immune to smallpox is what led to the discovery. Now, it's more understandable that some people would want to oppose something so raw and, let's be honest, pretty disgusting by today's standards. However, we've made significant advancements in the field since then and now things are much more sanitary, controlled and effective. In more recent years, with how the internet makes it easier to find like-minded people, the anti-vax group, like many other conspiracy theory groups, gain more traction because it's easier for these people to clump together and propagate their beliefs onto others. So it's become a very substantial and growing threat to our health. Another thing that tends to scare anti-vaxxers is the amount of things we get in a vaccine today. This is just due to our increasing knowledge and how to protect against more and more deadly or life-altering diseases. In the 1940s, we had protection against smallpox, pertussis since 1914, diphtheria since 1926, and tetanus since 1938. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis were given together in a combination called DTP. In the 1950s, we added an extremely important one, polio. Some countries gave it intravenously and some countries gave it orally. Polio was very serious and parents were really scared of the polio epidemics during the summer. They had to send their children away to live in the country with relatives and keep them away from swimming pools. Much of the population was actually sending a bit of their money to the White House to help find a vaccine for polio. When Jonas Stock invented it in 1955, he became an overnight hero and the entire country celebrated. In 2016, there were a total of 42 cases of polio compared to the 350,000 in 1988 when the effort started. One of the three different strands of polio, WPV2, was declared to have been globally eradicated since 2015. Another strand, WPV3, is last known to have caused polio on November 11, 2012, about six years ago. The rest of the cases are all caused by the last strand, WPV1. In the 1960s, we added three more important ones, measles since 1963, mumps since 1967, and rubella since 1969. These were combined and named the MMR vaccine. In the 1970s, we removed one because we had successfully eradicated smallpox. So as of 1972, the smallpox vaccine was no longer recommended. During this decade, research continued, but nothing new was introduced. Between 1985 and 1994, we added protection against hip disease. This was infecting about 20,000 children per year and killing about 1,000 of them. 
In 1995, we added protection against hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is up to 100 times more infectious than the HIV AIDS virus. This vaccine currently works 95% of the time. About one third of the global population contracted hepatitis B at one point in their lives, and about 343 million of those are chronic. This virus still kills more than 750,000 people per year. In 1995, we added protection against chickenpox, rotavirus, hepatitis A, and pneumococcal disease. We've also discontinued the oral polio vaccine and kept only the intravenous method. Along with this, we've also developed an influenza vaccine that helps give great protection against the most likely strands of the virus during a specific year. So the entire list of protection in a vaccine today is as follows. Diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, hip disease, chickenpox, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, pneumococcal disease, rotavirus, and influenza. This mix is not something we should be scared about. When these diseases were around, you didn't need to contract them for them to consume a big part of your life. Just having to constantly be wary of them, holding yourself back from doing the things you might enjoy, and constantly being stressed and scared of it could be nearly as bad as the disease itself. So instead of being scared of having this much protection through vaccines, you should be happy that you don't have to deal with either the disease itself or the stress of avoiding it. So now let's talk about our immune systems so that we can talk about how vaccines work. Our immune system is actually a layer of defenses. All plants and animals have an innate response as the first layer of defense against pathogens. This layer is meant to recognize components of pathogens that are common among a wide variety of microorganisms. So the response here is nonspecific. This layer is triggered when either a pathogen is recognized or when a damaged, injured, or stressed cell sends out alarm signals. This layer doesn't retain information for long-lasting immunity. If a bacteria or virus gets past the innate response, vertebrates also have an adaptive immune system as the second layer that gets activated by the innate response. During this stage, the immune system adapts its response during an infection to improve its recognition of the pathogen. Once the pathogen is eliminated, this improved response is retained in the form of immunological memory and allows our immune system to mount stronger and faster attacks each time the pathogen is encountered. Vaccines are a biological preparation that provides active acquired immunity to a specific disease. They usually contain agents that are similar to the disease-causing microorganisms and are usually made from greatly weakened or killed forms of the pathogen, its toxins, or one of its surface proteins. This teaches our adaptive immune system to recognize the agent as a threat, destroy it, and remember it so that we're able to mount a strong and rapid defense if we encounter it in the future. With global effort, vaccines make it possible to entirely eradicate diseases. Once a disease is eradicated, the vaccination against it can be removed from the mix, such as the smallpox vaccine that's no longer necessary. Anti-vaxxers often go with a fear or mistrust of the entities that create and distribute the vaccines, despite having a scientific consensus for a long time, as well as continued research that continues to show that vaccines are safe and effective. They tend to believe things like vaccines causing autism or changing our DNA. This is partly because of people associating these things even though they have no relationship. This is easy to do since all you have to find are two similar trends up or trends down, regardless of how unrelated they are. An example of this is seeing that becoming vegan is an increasing trend in recent years, and there are also more car accidents in recent years. Now, if you put both of those on a chart, it still doesn't make any sense because they're not related at all. Being vegan does not increase your likelihood of getting into a car accident, but it would be made to look that way on a chart. Well, vaccines and autism are the same way. Because of the persistent claim that vaccines cause autism, many studies have been done by a multitude of groups. Through all these studies, there has been absolutely no link found between vaccines and autism. All these studies found that vaccines are very safe and that the amount of antigen from vaccines was the same between children with or without autism. As for the ingredients in vaccines, there's one that's been studied very specifically and that's thimerosal. 
Thimerosal is a mercury-based agent that prevents growth of germs like bacteria and fungi in vials that contain multiple doses. Without it, germ contamination could cause severe local reactions, serious illness, or even death, so it's a very important ingredient to have in multi-dose vials. At least nine studies have been made and none found any link between thimerosal and autism. What they found was that it actually favors a rejection of a causal relationship between thimerosal and autism. These studies also never found a link between the measles, mumps, rubella or MMR vaccine and autism in children. It's worth noting that between 1999 and 2001, as a prevention to these claims, thimerosal was removed or reduced to trace amounts in all childhood vaccines, except for some flu vaccines, in an effort to reduce mercury exposure in children. As for other ingredients, no links have ever been found between these ingredients and autism either. There are also other claims by anti-vaxxers that vaccines change the brain chemistry as well as the DNA itself, but that's just nonsense that I won't really go into here. Just keep in mind, all we're doing is teaching the immune system to recognize pathogens, which is its main function anyway. We're not making the body do anything it's not supposed to. Just a crash course for the body on how to fight off deadly or life-altering infections. You may have already heard the term herd immunity. This is an indirect protection against infectious diseases when a large enough percentage of the population is immune to it, and this immunity generally comes from vaccines. Herd immunity can break the chain of infection and slow or stop the spread of a disease. The more immune people you have in a population, the less likely it is that someone that's not immune would contract the disease. So right now, people who are not vaccinated are still indirectly protected by the responsible people that do get vaccinated. If too many people stop getting vaccinated, our herd immunity will get weaker and diseases will start to spread into the population again if they haven't yet been completely eradicated. Another thing we need to talk about are the preferred methods of protection for anti-vaxxers. Some of these bogus alternatives include essential oils, homeopathic medicine, breastfeeding, herbs, vitamins, foods, probiotics, chiropractic adjustments, sun exposure, fermented cod liver oil, and probably more. Several surveys showed that the majority of homeopath practitioners advise against vaccination. The same thing happens with naturopaths. This is so that they can recommend their products to you instead and make more money on your fear of vaccination. Homeopathic medicine is harmless on its own, but it can become very dangerous if it's used instead of effective treatments because it contains no active ingredients and doesn't stimulate the immune system at all. Many governments enforce labeling these products as not being a suitable replacement or alternative to vaccination. As for essential oils, they can smell nice, but that's about it. Essential oils do nothing for the immune system. Breastfeeding is always encouraged, but the passive immunity it provides doesn't help at all against vaccine-preventable diseases. Breast milk contains IgA antibodies rather than the IgG antibodies that you would need to prevent diseases like measles, tetanus, chickenpox, etc. Herbs, vitamins, foods, probiotics, chiropractic adjustments, sun exposure, and fermented cod liver oil all won't do anything for the immune system. While some might be beneficial as a supplement for general health, none will teach the immune system how to fight off diseases. Most people who refuse vaccinations and haven't contracted any diseases accredit their health to the list of things we just went over. This is wrong. They're giving credit to things that have absolutely no effect when in fact they should be giving credit to herd immunity. There are always some people who truly can't get vaccinated and these people can only rely on herd immunity. The more people who refuse vaccinations voluntarily, the more we put these people at risk. There are no alternatives to vaccination. Here's some of the data on how effective vaccines have been up to now. Here's chickenpox going down to almost nothing since 1998. Here's diphtheria rapidly going down until almost nothing by 1955. Here's hip disease going down quickly as well, down to near zero. Here's measles that seems to have fought hard to remain alive since we introduced the vaccine, but we ended up winning and have a near zero infection rate today. Here's mumps down to almost zero as well. 
Here's pertussis, which we got under control, but our current vaccine is only about 80 to 85% effective, so it's able to stay alive for the time being. Here's rubella that we got down to essentially zero. And here's tetanus that we also got under control, but our current vaccine requires three doses, so cases are still happening. And you can find more of these graphs from many different sources if you want to know more. The implications of refusing vaccinations are significant for even the population that does get vaccinated. Part of the strength of vaccination is herd immunity. If herd immunity weakens, we essentially lengthen the time required to eradicate a disease, so we also lengthen the amount of time the vaccine has to be given. The threat of these diseases gaining strength again is why some countries have implemented mandatory vaccinations, especially for children enrolling in school. Failure to get your children vaccinated can also lead to the refusal of having that child attend public schools, even in districts that don't have mandatory vaccinations. Now, when it comes to the flu vaccine to protect against the influenza virus, there seems to be a whole lot of confusion about how it works, so let's talk about that for a minute. Influenza is a virus that's constantly changing and mutating. These changes can occur in two different ways, drift and shift. A shift is when a significant change occurs in the virus and results in an entirely new subtype. When shifts happen, most people have essentially zero protection against the new subtype. A shift like this occurred in 2009 when an H1N1 virus with a new combination of genes emerged to infect people and quickly spread, causing a pandemic. A drift, on the other hand, is a small genetic change that happens constantly as the virus replicates. These mutated viruses are closely related to each other and usually share the same antigenic properties that the immune system will recognize. This means that with minor changes, the immune system is able to respond appropriately and defend against the infection. If enough time goes by and enough drift mutations occur, then the change might become significant enough that the body won't recognize it anymore. These small but constant changes is exactly why the flu vaccine has to be reviewed every year. When we review the flu vaccine composition every year, we protect against the most likely occurrences for that year because every flu season is different. This doesn't guarantee that you won't contract the flu because the unlikely strands could be the ones in circulation, or you might be unlucky enough to contract the flu before your body builds up an immunity to it, which takes two weeks after vaccination. By getting the flu vaccine, you're essentially protecting yourself against the most likely ones to occur. Some added benefits as well is that if you do get sick, the symptoms can be much milder. You reduce your chances of having to be hospitalized. It can be life-saving for children, older people too, or people with respiratory or immune system problems. And you're also helping protect the people around you. You should also know that very often people mistake bad colds for the flu since they have so many symptoms in common. Some indications that you might have the flu rather than a bad cold is if you have fever that persists for more than a week, if your fever goes away and returns, if your fever goes above 101 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you have muscle pain. This is just general information though, so a doctor will be much better equipped to give you more information. So to conclude this video, if you're pro-vaccine, you could share this video and help spread the message. If you're on the fence about getting vaccinated or vaccinating your children, please do the responsible thing and get vaccinated. Vaccines are very safe and there are no alternatives to the immunity that vaccination provides. We need to keep that herd immunity as strong as possible if we want to eventually eradicate these diseases and keep infection rates as low as possible while they're still around. One thing is certain, if you were to catch any of these life-altering diseases or be the reason why someone else catches it, you would trade it all for the vaccine. And the more people that don't get vaccinated, the higher the chance that this will happen. It's no different than putting on your seatbelt in your car. It might be a tad uncomfortable, but in the case of an accident, you wouldn't hesitate to go back and put it on to save your life. If you like this video and want more content like this, please like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions about what you'd like to talk about, put it down in the comments below or come follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.